as, as a football player, 473 games, 170 goals, um, that would be viewed as a good record nowadays. How, I mean, how did you see yourself as a football player? Well, I, I always uh, knew that I had to be a forward because I couldn't tackle a fish supper. And uh, right for the first game of the season, I always uh, uh, was desperate to get uh, off the nothing sort of thing. And uh, the sooner I got off it, uh, the happier I was. But in the days, you were definitely five forwards and five defenders, and you were one or the other rather than in a modern game. Again, the tactics are quite different. Mm -hmm. And that, that career as a player, you know, you played for a few clubs, Hamilton, Clyde, um, Dundee. I've got, I've got here that your debut for Dundee was in a, a five-man defeat to Dundee United. Yes, I thought you'd bring that <laughs> one up. <laughs> what the, what the? And uh, it showed right away that I was going to make a difference for them. <laughs> but uh, to be completely honest, uh, uh, we got hammered that day, actually. And that was the time of the foreign players came mm -hmm. from Denmark and different places that Jerry Kerr had brought over some fantastic players. And uh, it was uh, a result that uh, I could never forget, actually, especially living in Dundee for mm -hmm. quite some time. At that time, you know, Dundee would have been seen as the established club in the city. How did the Dundee players view Dundee United at that time? Were they very much a young upstart, so to speak? Or <coughs> No, we always, we always knew that, that uh, it was going to be a difficult game, very difficult game, because they, they had uh, gone uh, to, uh, uh, I think it was Holland and different mm -hmm. players and brought some fantastic players over. And uh, I would say at the time that I joined was one of the worst times to be joining uh, Dundee because uh, uh, Jerry Kerr was doing a fantastic job with Dundee United and some mm. of the players he brought in were fantastic players for them. Yeah. You, you were then made coach, you were brought back to Dundee, made, co made coach now. Were you aware at the time you were a coach of the, you know, the, the reputation that you were building? You know, uh, were you aware that you, know, you, you, had, you had this special thing as a coach? No, I was, I was never exceptionally confident uh, and that was a major uh, problem and it was John Prentice who had was my manager at Clyde and to be completely honest that was the club that I played my best football mm -hmm. with and uh, it was part time actually but uh, by far I was far more consistent there because John Prentice was like God to me uh, as a manager and uh, he definitely got the best out of me by a long way mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when I got transferred to Dundee uh, it was uh, a different level, Alan Gulzine and people like that were playing uh, just before Alan Gulzine got sold actually and uh, a wee drop of his money was used to buy me. <laughs> uh, unfortunately the Dundee supporters thought they were buying a really good player and especially the first game result, it was the, uh, too easy for yeah. us. Uh, but. Uh, I really never, ever, I don't think, was appreciated with uh, the Dundee supporters. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean uh, any harm about that. No. I, I really believe they pay their money, they uh, see what they see. And uh, at the end of the day, the one thing I feel angry about is that they, they never seem to appreciate the amount of goals they score mm -hmm. for them. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, they pay their money, they have every right to. Uh, like who they like and yeah, uh, don't like who they like. Mm -hmm. So at the age of 34, you were then asked to come across the road to Tannadice to become the manager. I mean, at that time, was was that a big decision to, to move across the road from Dance to Tannadice? No, it was the easiest decision in the world. What was happening at the uh, uh, Dance part was uh, uh, the chairman had chosen David White to take over as manager. And I had been there for about two years, I think, as coach with John Prentice. And John Prentice had decided to go away to New Zealand with his wife, Emigre. And uh, I was left hung out uh, to die, sort of thing. But anyway, uh, the Dundee United job uh, was available just after uh, John Prentice had announced he was leaving. And uh, I sneaked away over to St Andrews to meet the directors. Well, actually, Tommy Gallagher was the one that spoke to me and said to us, uh, and 
I really appreciate a lot to Tommy because he was not only a really good reporter but he was a really nice person. But mm -hmm. he had recommended me to the Dundee United board that she'd definitely try and get me because I was coaching for I think it was about a year and a half to yeah. two years with Dundee and uh, they'd asked to meet me. So I sneaked over to St Andrews and uh, the directors discussed whatever they wanted to find out sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And on the Monday morning the phoned us and offered us the, the Dundee United job and uh, uh, I was never uh, one of Mr Gellerty's friends at Dundee whether it was a player or whether it was a coach so yeah. I was glad to uh, get the opportunity but it was uh, definitely uh, a, a difficult time to to move, but I had no option because mm -hmm. it was either that yeah. or they would probably have. Uh, they might have sacked us, they might have kept us because Davy White and I played t together with Clyde, and Davy White and I travelled to the training three nights a week and so on. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was the best decision I ever made in my life, and the directors phoned me. It was a Sunday night, and it was <laughs> lashing rain actually, typical Dundee weather. <laughs> No, typical Glasgow weather, it's far more rain in Glasgow, but anyway, uh, they phoned me I think in the Monday or something and offered us a job mm -hmm. and uh, that's how it happened mm -hmm. and there was no problem with Mr Gellert, I was glad to get rid of me. Yeah. When, when you moved over to Tannadice, what was the first things you set about doing? What was, I mean you obviously had a vision and a, a plan of how to proceed with the club. Well the first thing I said was, uh, the first thing that I was hit with if the Dundee, if the train didn't come in for Glasgow, you couldn't start your training because there was nobody living here. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a very, very strict uh, ideas on what was good for players and what wasn't so good for players. And uh, I'm a teetotaler, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, by that time, if the train for Glasgow or Edinburgh were late, we couldn't even start training because half the, mm -hmm. the players and more than half the players were travelling from both Glasgow and Edinburgh again and the first thing I said was that anybody that I sign will be moving to uh, stay in the Dundee area uh, because uh, I want them to feel the importance of being a Dundee uh, a United player and it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Uh, we actually uh, lost a few players. Uh, George Fleming, for instance, he was a, a very good signer. He turned us down first of all and then uh, eventually changed his mind and came back and did a great job for us. Then we had uh, one of the first signers was Andy Gray. I was very fortunate actually, really lucky with some of the early players, but one of the first signers was Andy Gray and he came from Glasgow as well, but I made them all stay in uh, Dundee during the week. Uh, training and let them go home at the weekends. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, I lost a few players, but uh, uh, as I said earlier, it was without doubt, mm -hmm. absolutely, uh, I didn't know at the time, but what absolutely the best decision I made because the players really got uh, really, really thick together. And not only that, course, we did wee bits and pieces for the wives as well, Ken, and the, the kids, for instance, the year we won the league, uh, we uh, took the wives and the, the husbands, obviously, but we also took the kids to Los Angeles and, and so on. And yeah. uh, I always felt uh, if, if we won the, if I won the manager of the month sort of thing, uh, Doris took all the wives out on the Thursday night uh, or Friday night. Uh, just for whatever they uh, uh, did, but it was definitely a cup of tea as well. <laughs> but uh, it, all these things, honestly, were done, and what I realised after it was how important it was because they really felt uh, part of the area, sort of thing, mm -hmm. and more close to the the. the uh, the, the closeness of the players and the wives and everything together yeah. was one of the biggest assets we had. The, the only one they hated was me. The players, not the wives. The wives were magnificent. When we went to 
European games and they went, they, they would buy a hanky or a pair of soaps or something for me and the wives were brilliant yeah, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> the husband's never appreciated me. <laughs> When when you did you, when you signed as you you know you brought in the sort of the S sign it's quite a, quite a lot of them more than certainly was there at the time you also brought in some you know what we'd call experienced journeyman pros was that just purely a case of trying to balance well you, you brought the youngsters through well the important thing was some really good players at Dundee United were uh, really old for uh, for Dennis Gillespie. Mm -hmm. Uh, Doug Smith, uh, absolutely brilliant players and brilliant service uh, servants uh, to Dundee United and uh, Boy Wilson for Rangers, a uh, wide left player, but there was, uh, they were definitely a, uh, the age was a major problem and it was without doubt, uh, as I said, the only two S forms, it was uh, a big, big job to get uh, the even the youth policy started because, the, as I said, they'd only two players, mm -hmm. they, had, they had no youth policy. But uh, the first time I went, uh, one, one Sunday just after I got the job, I, I went up to uh, Broughty, uh, the park up the road, Broughty, and uh, I goes to the, the door after the game, Ken, where they, they stayed, and I said mm -hmm. to the woman, the mother came at the door, Ken, and I says, uh, I would like your son to come and train with Dundee United to see uh, if, uh, uh, how good he was, sort of thing. And uh, she says, I was up her arms and she says, no, 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 no. If you were with the team you were with uh, last week, <laughs> <laughs> I would have been really, really happy. But, she went, but I, never, I never ever knew whether that kid made yeah. the game uh -huh. or no, but uh, that was the start. They didn't want to come near Dundee United. <laughs> and uh, some of the first signers were magnificent. Ken Graham Payne and David Neary alone. Uh, John Lightfoot keeps telling me that uh, Payne was the best player ever. And I keep uh, kidding him on that I was one of the best players <laughs> ever. <laughs> Neary was the bad either. How, how important was that, you know, guys like John Lightfoot and all your coaching and stuff and your scouts? No, how John, important were they? Well, John Letford actually over uh, two or three years I signed an awful lot of players. Mm -hmm. Kenny Murphy, for instance, I think he got capped for Australia. Uh, he, he went to Australia. Mm -hmm. Alan Both, I think he well he was definitely in the pool when I was in uh, Spain in the World Cup, mm -hmm. and uh, he was in the the pool uh, in New Zealand, and uh, they were both early signings mm -hmm. that uh, I had made, although. They never really made it to the uh, first team, uh, but uh, John Lepford was uh, even still uh, friends, and there's no one of them keep a friend, uh, mm -hmm. Jim McLean, for that length of time. <laughs> yeah, well, the, I would imagine as well the board in the early years, you know, they, 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 they had to show their support to you and belief in your management. Well, honestly, I think it was about £5,000. I thought I was going to a club with fantastic amount of money again in their bank and uh, it didn't take me long to realise that uh, there wasn't going to be a lot of big signings uh -huh. and uh, at the end of the day it was an era where the freedom of contract was such that uh, once you got a player, for instance when I signed with Hamel Mackies, I signed a one year contract and I signed a one year contract in the whole of my career uh -huh. up to, I, I moved to Dundee actually and the uh, clubs had definitely far too uh, much uh, tightness on the, the deciding players whether they were mm -hmm. staying here or no sort of thing and uh, something had to change but unfortunately it's gone far too far the other way now and it really is ridiculous mm -hmm. now that uh, there's no such a thing as any loyalty with the modern players to any clubs it's uh, and partly because of the agents, actually. I, yeah. I really blame mm -hmm. the agents for uh, making players in the modern game uh, a wee bit restless mm -hmm. because obviously the agents only make money when they move and yeah. they're wanting to move over the bigger clubs all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was fortunate to get out just <laughs> uh, a wee bit late, but not too uh -huh. uh, late at the three of my contract. Yeah. And go back, you know, the early years, and when we get to 1974, 
and the, the, the club reached their first ever Scottish Cup final. Um, I think I think United fans look on that as a significant marker, you know, in the, the club establishing itself in Scottish football. Were you aware at that time, you know, how how big an how big an achievement that was for the I club? I obviously knew the, the record before, but mm -hmm. uh, the most important thing was uh, to progress, and uh, it was all down to the the players and the, their. Uh, uh, Togetherness. One of the best decisions I said earlier was, was without doubt making them live here. Well, they were living all over yeah. Scotland uh, in the beginning, and uh, I always thought, in particular, getting the wives out together as mm -hmm. well was important uh, to keep them happy. Yeah. Because if they're happy, then the husbands uh, are far happier. And uh, there was a brilliant togetherness. Uh, in the club that wasn't there beforehand because, as I say, they were travelling for all over Scotland. And it was a vital factor uh, because uh, George Fleming actually decided that uh, he wouldn't move and then he changed his mind. Mm -hmm. He's still up here now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He owns a pub in the ferry. I think he owns a pub in the ferry, but he did own one. I think, I mean, that, that is something, you know, that you say, you find that a lot of the players that moved to Dundee to play for Dundee United. Right? You know, they've, they've ended up loving the rest of the yeah. here, and that, that probably yeah. shows the close knit yeah. nature of the relationship. Yeah, and I, it honestly is vital when a team, mm -hmm. uh, when it's uh, a tennis or a golf or something like that, else, you've only one person to blame. Uh, but uh, football players have. Uh, well, I was great the day when we won, but when we get beat, it was other 10 players. Yeah. And uh, especially the second part that I just said uh, was uh, football players' easy way out of mm -hmm. uh, defeats, sort of thing. But I used to say to them, you look in the mirror and you see who's done it or who has they done it. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't bother with the other ten, I'll bother about them. Yeah, constantly. You know. Another thing that was made much of at the time you took over was the fact that the players' fitness seemed to improve. Was that, was that something that was without, very important to you? Without well? doubt. I was really fortunate as a manager, sorry, as a, a player, because Bobby Ansel was a magnificent manager. Bobby Cease was one of the best coaches you could ever work for. But I was also really, really lucky. Uh, McCray, the manager at Kilmarnock, was unbelievable on fitness. And uh, that was the last club I played mm -hmm. for. And it definitely, I always knew it was important, but uh, when I saw the way we trained at Kilmarnock and the way we trained at Dundee, there was a big, big difference. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubts at all that you can play far better the fitter you are. And uh, I, as I said, I was really fortunate yeah. that uh, I worked with uh, managers that uh, not only helped me with the quality of the game and tactics and so on, which is obviously uh, vital Mm -hmm. but you've got to be able to run yeah. and run for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I can go back to the 74 um, Scottish Cup final, two two players who are going to be at the dinner um, who played in that game, you've mentioned Andy Gray already. Now Andy obviously, 18 years of age, you know, playing in that game, um, he eventually left the club for you know the first six figure fee received by the club, £110,000. There's a guy you've brought from Glasgow, brought him through and made the club money. Was that the model that you were looking basically to achieve? Well, he tells everybody this story actually that uh, he, so, he thought that I was a little bee uh, because I used to bring him back in the afternoon uh, for a wee bit of extra training. Mm -hmm. But at that time we had next to no S forms again, so, and I hadn't finished playing uh, that long. Can. Mm -hmm. And I used to take him out in the, the park at Tanadice. Uh, for extra in the afternoon and I would cross the ball to uh, his head, he was magnificent. Mm -hmm. I'd cross the ball to his left foot, he was magnificent. But I used to cross the ball now and again to his right foot because he was rubbish with him. And uh, also the, uh, he tells everybody the story about it. He says, I thought the wee was uh, just uh, didn't like me sort of thing, Ken. He says, and he's told everybody this story in England, Ken. He says, I now realise, he's finished with Hibbrook, Ken, uh, uh, this time, and he says, I now realise what he was yeah. doing for me. And uh, even yet, I, I phoned for him um, to get me his, 
charities for the Lord Provis here for the mm -hmm. charities that the Lord Provis uh, is involved with and he still yeah. uh, gives us the uh, jersey, gets us jerseys for them. Yeah, well as I say, he's, he's one of them that's you know very keen to come up to the dinner. Another one who, you know, was at the club before you arrived but when I speak about these senior players, Andy Rowland, a, a great you know favourite of the United fans, someone that you utilised you know within that team as, as an experienced player? Uh, he was very very nervous actually, uh, but he was just a good player mm -hmm. And a good attacking fullback rather than a brilliant defending fullback. But when the 4 2 or the 4 4 2 systems mm -hmm. came in, it, it helped Andy because it's obviously we, it used to be three defenders, the right back, the centre half, mm -hmm. and the left back was the main defenders. But uh, the overlapping fullbacks, and Andy was brilliant mm -hmm. at getting forward. He wasn't the best defender in the country, but he was absolutely brilliant at attacking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, another person that will be at the dinner, you know, Walter Smith. Now, Walter was at the club from, I think, 1966. Didn't feature regularly in the team until, you know, 1973 under yourself. What was it you saw in Walter that, you know, first of all, you, you, you put him in your team quite a lot, but they also made you bring him back as a player coach and then assistant manager? What, what was that you seen in Walter? That? Well, to be completely honest, Walter was never good enough as a player. <laughs> <laughs> But that's not true. Walter was honestly a fantastic reader of the game. He was not the quickest, he was not the biggest, but he was a brilliant defender because he was reading of the game. And uh, when I went there, I was doing everything. And there, was, there was no other coaches. Yeah. Doug Cowie had left the club uh, just before I went there, although he came back to scout for us. And uh, I was looking around the older players uh, I was always trying to save money where we could save money and uh, taking a, uh, maybe too much on my own plate but uh, the Walter was always asking questions again and I used to give him pelters because uh, uh, I had to answer in front of everybody else sort of thing but uh, it showed how interesting he was in the tactical side of the game and uh, Walter actually was more in the reserve team at the time when I went there and uh, he actually started his coaching career uh, by looking after the reserves. Yeah. In the days the reserves played at the uh, Ibrox if the first team Rangers and Dundee United were playing at Tanada or something and uh, I needed somebody to look after the reserves in the sand because it, there was no other coaches uh, on the staff at the time and that's how it started with Walter and uh, Walter was fantastic, his, his uh, thoughts and uh, he actually got married shortly but I don't know how he managed to have a family because he definitely was uh, absolutely brilliant at coming in the next day with someone how is about us trying this and something written in, mm. in papers and that and he was really really interested in the job and uh, we definitely I had got stuff for uh, uh, Bobby Seath as you I said was a fantastic coach and uh, stuff that they'd been doing doing in England and so on and I definitely was fortunate with uh, McCree the manager at Kilmarnock because he was mm. a, a running fitness uh, was a vital factor there, uh, so um, I got an awful lot of running things to do uh, for the players and yeah. I always believed uh, that uh, uh, the fitter you are the better chance of winning and fitness was vital and uh, uh, Walter became the more or less the manager of the reserves yeah. in the beginning but uh, he tells everybody the story about me selling them for something like uh, five thousand pounds and buying them back for two and a half thousand pounds. <laughs> and he keeps telling us every time I meet him again, there's another hundred games on the games, but he, he says we got undefeated for so many games. With it. But to be honest, we did go on a run, mm -hmm. but it was nothing like the yeah, number of yeah. games that he says. But he keeps giving the stick for sell them and then buy them back at a profit. <laughs> And <laughs> going on this run with fantastic uh, results, uh, fantastic number of results, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
in the early years, you know, I think we see football nowadays. You know, managers seem to get two or three games, and then they're they're under pressure. You know, you'd commented on the United, you know, season seventy five, seventy six saw us avoid relegation on the final day of the season by a draw against Rangers. Um, you know, the, the board stuck with you through the days, and you know we then seen the team flourish. Um, again, is is that testament to the the, the board's trust and and belief in what you were trying to achieve? Johnson Grant, there's a lot of people I owe a lot to, and Johnson Grant was without doubt the best chairman that I could ever have. And uh, actually, it was, uh, I think it was this house actually when the Rangers had offered us a job, and it was tears in his eyes, and it sweeties for me, and something for Doris, and it was flowers or something for Doris, and uh, I was going to meet the Rangers on the Sunday actually. We'd actually have beat day with somebody on the Saturday and they come up on the Sunday, the Saturday night and you know, we want you to stay and so on. and as I said, sweeties for me that mm -hmm. I guess a bottle of wine. But uh, Johnson Grant was like a second father to me. Uh -huh. He was a magnificent uh, for to work with again. There was one time I was uh, thinking I was hesitating because uh, I think it was about 5,000 signing on fee we were giving Alec Rennie, who was with St. Johnson, but he was available uh, mm -hmm. free. And uh, he did a fantastic job for us, actually. And it was Johnson Grant that came to me and says, look, he says, if you don't gamble, you don't win. He says, you've got to uh, decide that he's worth that sort of thing. I says, honestly, I think he'll do a great job for us. And mm -hmm. he did do a great job uh, over a uh, fairly short period of time, but uh, uh, he was honestly a magnificent chairman and I was really, really fortunate with uh, the directors that I had at mm -hmm. Dundee United at that time. Yeah. Moving on through, you know, in 1977 you're building this team, 1977 sees David Nery cap for Scotland, that was, you know, our first full international for Scotland, um, you know, I imagine that would have given you a lot of pride. Um, the fact that you you know you develop David and, and how he then went on to play, but the players then you know generally coming through from youngsters and then becoming internationalists. That's probably all there. Well, your our youth policy was second to none actually, and uh, the people like uh, Doug Cowie had come back as a scout for uh, me and Davy Small and uh, myself. I never went to church at all during the time I was in fit my manager and uh, the whole area here was was covered and uh, as I said earlier, I think I said earlier that the two S forms was all the HUD at Dundee yeah. United when I went there and John Letford who was running one of the, the boys teams, David Neary and Graham Payne and the quality of the players that we were able to sign at that time was unbelievable actually uh, and uh, the progress, Andy Gray for instance was one of the, the best signings I ever made and it was a scout, uh, uh, this, my scout at that time in Glasgow was the physiotherapist at Dens when I was a player and uh, he did a fantastic job in Glasgow at uh, getting us players from there because uh, most of them would, uh, most of the better players was one Rangers or Celtics. Uh, and Andy Gray, I nearly missed Andy Gray actually, he come up and they phoned me the next day, how did they do? I said, oh, it was uh, terrible. I says, uh, but uh, the main of them looked that good actually, I think it was four kids. Mm -hmm. He says, look, bring this boy up again. I says, right, I'll play a game. And uh, we, we brought the, uh, another the two yeah. or three of them back up again. And uh, it was at night and I had uh, Andy Gray's brother in the office at half time trying to sign up. <laughs> it was unbelievable uh -huh. that uh, the first game he had they showed anything. But it, well, we never played a game, we were doing functions rather than a game the first time. I said, look, I said, we're better doing a game. I says, and it, it was one I could have lost for yeah. instance again. Mm -hmm. And even to this day, I, I left the phone and uh, speak to Andy Gray and uh, he's still in contact all yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. But it tells everybody doing in England that I was a wee bee, so <laughs> the training thing. That, that scouting system, you know, you, you mentioned there that your guy through in Glasgow was your physio at Dundee. 
was that simply a case that you, you picked guys that you'd respected throughout your career and used the most, them? The most important thing was local. If you lose players locally, you're uh, not doing the job. And uh, Doug Cowie and Davy Small and Kenny Cameron were fantastic locally. To be mm -hmm. honest, Kenny was more the rest of Scotland yeah. rather than uh, uh, the main Dundee ones was Davy Small, myself and uh, Doug Cowie. And uh, if you look at the, the players and that won the league sort of thing and how mm -hmm. many of them were from Dundee, yeah. you realise how uh, easy it was. Dundee were nowhere near uh, the youth policies that we were, uh, that we started and uh, to be completely honest it was without doubt the only way that uh, we could get some success. We had no chance of Dundee United ever having enough money to buy players. Yeah. So we had to rear them and the good thing at that time was that there wasn't the freedom of contract and mm -hmm. you could sign them on uh, eight years or whatever <laughs> and uh, that was vital. Success certainly came with you know the League Cup win in 1979. Um, I guess Abdi after the the first game drawn at Hamden, coming back to Dens Park. You know, the recurring theme I think throughout you know Dens Park being a successful place, and then of course again the following year winning it against Dundee. What was your well winning the cup was we were the luckiest team in the world because we were pathetic at Hamden. I can't remember a game we played well at Hamden actually, and uh, it's well known the record at Hamden, but. Uh, I think we beat Queen's Park once actually, which I keep telling everybody about. <laughs> Never forget that. <laughs> uh, but uh, the Aberdeen game, to be honest, uh, Alec Ferguson was the manager at, uh, and he was a very close friend of mine. But uh, the home game, which was a replay sort of thing, mm -hmm. was played at Dens Park and uh, we hammered them, absolutely hammered mm -hmm. them. It was lashing rain as well. But uh, uh, we beat them 3 0 and yeah. Wally Pettigrew hasn't scored two goals and that. Kirkwood is still down, but that's a good ball to Pettigrew. Still a chance. He's caught. <laughs> 14 minutes gone. Dundee United have taken the lead. Traffic clashes a great ball. Clark is out. Oh, great play by Clark. Clark read it well. Right out of his goal, out of his penalty area. Nearly again. Now Capel to Bannon. Beautifully cultured player, Bannon. Holt. Stunnock on the left again. Fleming is inside. That's pretty good, done it. Please. Now, Sturrock on the break. Willie Frederick is inside and he's on the clear. Willie kicks it off and no goal. 3 0. The break was on by Sturrock. He had pace and drive, kept his eye on the ball. Looked up for Pettigrew, couldn't see him, tried to cut it round, and Willie Muller nudged it away from Clark. And there it goes, the final whistle. United have won the Scottish League Cup. There is Jim McLean, having been near on us so often. And this is United's first major win in their long history. Players. Uh, really realised how lucky they were mm -hmm. and they definitely done the business but uh, I still haven't worked out how to play at Hamden. <laughs> I think if every major cup final was played at Dens, would have won one of the year. One more. <laughs> and then, you know, again, the following year, we're fortunate in the sense that we get two against Dundee in the final and they decide to play it again, you know, at Dens Park. Um, and once again, the team went out and performed. Yeah, but it, it definitely was uh, uh, important in my opinion that it was at Dens actually because 
the results at Dens was quite good as well, which uh, I even smiled when we <laughs> would be Dundee at that at that time, especially having been an ex player and ex coach there that was dumped by the directors. Uh, and uh, as I said, that was really lucky that Dundee United job mm -hmm. came up because I would have went back to building houses if it hadn't have been that, and uh, I would never ever have got any fit by it. Uh, I'd been started as a back at the joiner again. Sturrock coming across for it. This is what Sturrock's good at. That's excellent play. Dodge with a chance. He's done it. Payne. Oh, that's the ball. Must be. Yes. That's a header again, brilliant save, and it's in. Paul Sturrock, three nothing. After you know, that's obviously winning the, the cup '79, winning the cup in '80. You know now that Dundee United have arrived on the, the Scottish football map. You know, the following year we again got to the final. You know, which is pretty, I think, a fairly unique circumstance to get to the final of the League Cup three years yeah. on. But what to go back to winning the first cup? Mm -hmm. Honestly. The best feeling I ever had in my life, everybody thinks it's all about money and that, was uh, Ernie Robertson had put an awful lot of money in it over the years in the club and he had tears in his eyes and he came over to me in the boardroom. We'd got the cup at Dens Park and we had uh, come down to Tanadice just to celebrate a wee bit and uh, he came over to me with tears in his eyes and this is better than any money that you ever got. Uh, in football, and he says, Jim, he says, I never thought I'd love to see the, the day, and that shows you how much mm -hmm. it meant to him, a person who had uh, honestly put mm, thousands and thousands of pounds in in the years he was there, and that was the first trophy they'd ever won, I think, and uh, that means more to me to this day than any money that I've ever earned in football, mm -hmm. yeah. seeing how much it meant to a director who'd been there for many, many years and mm -hmm. had never won anything. Did, did, that, did that make you change your approach in any way, you know, or, or is, it, is it just a case no, of... No, I was that? always crab <laughs> uh, and always very demanding, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I always uh, had felt that uh, everybody had to look at their self both when they win and lose. And I always thought that the too many players look in the mirror when they, they get beat and blame all the other ten players. If you're in a, a tennis player or a golfer or whatever, there's nobody you can blame other than yourself. But I always used to say to them, I want you to always look in the mirror and see yourself. I says, and think you, uh, the, why the result was what the result was. And the point I was making is that uh, if they didn't they play too well, then obviously there was a chance we got beat, sort of thing. Yeah. And if they did play well enough, then we had obviously a far better chance of winning. And there's no doubts at all. I really believe that the players definitely uh, were very honest. I was really, really lucky uh, that uh, the players that we got over the time that. Uh, and as I say, Doug Cowie and Davy Small and people like that were vital. Just as important as the players, actually, because it was them that was getting the players for me. Even in Glasgow, we were sneaking on Andy Gray and yeah. Kevin Gallagher and people like that yeah. the, uh, outside the Dundee area, sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, that, that's probably one of the important things, one of, one of the keys to being a, a successful manager over a period is being able to continually of all the football team and you know the, the, the team that's, that's won the League Cup there 79-80 then evolves again and you know you then produce this team that wins the Scottish Premier League um, you know for the first time in the club's history a massive massive achievement. It, it wasn't it, it was definitely I was the manager and it was me that was definitely without doubt uh, the boss uh, we know getting the boss in the house, again, I was desperate to get a boss somewhere. Or <laughs> so I went to my work, a bit sure I was the boss, and I, I honestly, I've got the daily record uh, uh, 
on the day that I took over, I've got the daily record the paper, mm -hmm. and it says in the, the, the paper that you do not, Jerry Kerr had, uh, I had agreed as well that Jerry Kerr should stay with the club anyway. And, and uh, I said, uh, and the, the quote I made was that uh, without any shadow of doubt, uh, you'll blame me if uh, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubts that uh, I will be the boss, they'll be doing it my way. And I don't know whether we'll be successful or not. I've got it through there, yeah. actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's one thing certain, I'll know exactly what I think when uh, the whistle goes at the end of the game. <laughs> and they'll be looking in the mirror and looking at their self rather than looking in the mirror and seeing another ten when we get beat. Yeah. But when we win, they look in the mirror and they see one person. Uh -huh. uh, and there's definitely, as I said earlier, being a team game, you can uh, pass the buck uh, about, but uh, I really uh, wanted honest players to look at themselves both in the victory and uh, the defeat. And uh, I definitely was really, really lucky with the yeah. quality of the players, but not only the honesty of the players as well. That is Nettie playing in midfield today with Richard Goff in centre defence. Milne. Wriggles clear, might just get the chip and he does, he's scored! Oh, what a great goal! Looked as if he might be losing his balance, but he went for the chip and he couldn't get a sweeter goal than that. Four minutes gone, one nothing. There's Scottig and nearly goes down, penalty kick. Bannon against Kelly. He saved it. That's it, though. The second. Fraser. Up come the blue shots. There's Sinclair trying to get in. Ferguson. He's done it. 2 1. There they are. Ready to celebrate. They would have longed to go to see the team. I'm keeping my eye on that dugout because they're going to come out of it like greyhounds out of a trap and who can blame them? Ten seconds into injury time still 2-1 the championship is on If it is possible, I have my eyes on the referee, it's gone, that's it, the finish. United have done it for the first time in their history. The Scottish Premier Division champions, and there is a man who walked out of Dens Park, 12 and a half years ago, out of Dens Park, where he was coached down the road, and totally transformed the face of football in this city. Taking away from Dundee their supremacy, there they are, the last draw, as the team come back out, and as they come back out, we can, I think, there they are, they're coming back, the police are allowing them to come out with Jim McLean to greet the supporters, and I must say, I don't think I've seen scenes like this in Dundee before, a jam-packed crowd, thousands outside, and there's a man, is he going to smile? Come on, Jim, give us a smile, he's done it, well, it's a half-smile, I'm not sure if he got a local anaesthetic for that, but he did say he'd promise to give us a smile this week, and he's done it. I spoke um, recently to Paul Hegarty about winning the league um, in '83, you know, and asked him the question: At what point, you know, did, did were you aware that this team? First of all, what point did you believe you could win the league, and you know, what point did you know? And I, I think Paul says it wasn't until you know really after the final whistle at Dens that day that he then appreciated, you know, what, what they'd done. Was that a similar feeling for yourself? They, I thought it was a, 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 the, the most difficult one to win, beyond any shadow of doubt, because uh, I've said this repeatedly since we won it, that uh, that was the most important one, because that really tells you how much 
you've paid back to the people that matter, and that's the people that put their hands in their mm -hmm. pockets. And uh, there's no doubt, uh, I always believed in consistency been vital because the people I felt most sorry for, uh, my, my, uh, I worked as a joiner sort of thing at, and uh, I never even got full time football until I signed with Dundee sort of thing. But uh, players definitely don't realise how lucky they are getting the opportunity yeah. uh, and having never worked in their life really for. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I always tried to make this, the players realise that they not only let themselves down when they didn't perform as well as they should be mm -hmm. doing, uh, but the, more importantly, letting the supporters down who pay the money is far more important than even thinking about yourself. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, that was one thing, it's well, well documented, um, you know, the time that you, you find the players for, you know, after, after a victory. And does that just you know emphasise what what you're saying there about making sure you entertain? Uh, well, the second half they were rubbish actually, and we were lucky to get away with that. I can't remember the game actually. But I've, I've got the paper cut to that one as well because uh, <laughs> uh, it was a, a learner part for the players as well. But there's no doubts that uh, I kept harping on that uh, just because you're free nothing up at half time, you can't just go out for uh, mm -hmm. a walk around the park because you can find yourself in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, the first 10 minutes is, uh, and the second half is just as important at times as the first 10 minutes of the game. Mm -hmm. And to be completely honest, I was really, really lucky with the players that we had. Not only the quality they had, but the people that surrounded us, fitness coaches, again, mm -hmm. with Graham Lowe, and we had uh, Stuart Hogg, yeah and uh, they were the fitness coaches to get the players really getting in the beginning. I used to take them and all they did was run around the park and mm -hmm. sprints and so on, but that uh, was uh, without doubt really professional uh, with uh, the likes of Graham was the ex-sprinter mm -hmm. and Stuart Hogg was a, an ex-sprinter coach sort of thing. And uh, uh, we definitely were thorough. It wasn't it just, uh, and, and I actually knew that fitness was so important because I stopped being a joiner and went to work with my father who was in a baker's business and uh, my father allowed me to uh, just work, to work on a Sunday actually as well but I only really worked maybe about four or five hours mm -hmm. yeah. and then I went and trained on my, my own because I was a part-time player with uh, Hamilton Ackies at the time. And I went and trained and I got my fitness up within no time. Actually, Bobby Ansel, I, I, I had been playing really well with Hamilton Ackies. Bobby Ansel was a mother role at the time. And he was desperate to sign us, but Hamilton wouldn't sell them to mother role because it's like Dundee, Dundee United <laughs> sort of thing. And I, unfortunately, I got sold to Clyde and it was still part-time as well. But the biggest, uh, Plus, with John Prentice became Clyde manager, and he used to. He tells everybody about the story. I used to wait all the time to announce the team before I would go near the jersey again. And he says honestly, he says it was my first day with the, at the team again. <laughs> this was at Clyde, but as I started to say, to you, I was actually training as a part-time player, but I was training after with my father's business. I was training in the afternoon myself, three days on my own and then at night I was training again so I was yeah, getting a double yeah. session on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or well, Tuesday, Thursday it was actually uh -huh. and uh, fitness became so important to me that's why Graham Lowe and Sir Hogg were yeah, yeah. Uh, some of the first signings that I signed for uh, the fitness side there. Yeah. Yeah. Into the eighties you know winning the league and um, we also by that by that stage you know we, we became quite a confident European team um, and of course the following year you know we, we, we got all the way to the, the semi-finals of the European Cup um, played against Roma you know and I think that, I think after we left the home leg you know 2 nothing up even the you know the United supporters were starting to dream of the possibility of getting to the European Cup final um, you know history since showed that you know not only was the result disappointing in Roma but there was you know the suggestions of wrongdoing on the referee's part and that. 
Do you look her back on that game with any bitterness or? I definitely do, but uh, unknown to everybody. Uh, Ernie Walker was actually in the European committee that were responsible for the European fit, uh, uh, football at mm -hmm. that time. And Ernie Walker told me years ago, before this was ever out in the paper, he says, Jim, he says, honestly, it, it was a, one game I was going to, I can't remember, and he came out his car and come straight over to me and says, Jim, he says, I've got to apologise to you. I says, what's that? He says, can he was on the committee, yeah. the, the, the European committee for that trophy. And uh, he says, there is absolutely no doubts at all that they definitely uh, tried to bring mm -hmm. the referee. And I tried to get to the, the bottom of it. He says, and they brushed it under the carpet. Mm -hmm. And that's word for word for Ernie Walker. Yeah. He told me, I says, look Ernie, I says, I appreciate you telling me this, I says, but to be completely honest, we definitely uh, uh, did not deserve to win it in the second leg. We just didn't play uh, well enough. And uh, at that time, I, I honestly, that's how I felt. Yeah. But now, looking back on it, I really, can recently, it's been in the paper, mm -hmm. yeah. I really hate the fact to cheat, the, the fact mm -hmm. that it was cheated on. And there's no doubts at all, the European committee and you and the brush under mm -hmm. the carpet, because Ernie Walker was uh, one of the most honest people. That mm -hmm. He was definitely very hard, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, he definitely was one of the best uh, you could get for honesty anyway. Yeah. When you look back at, you know, all the European exploits that that team achieved in some fantastic performances. Are there any that, that you look back and think that was the one, that was the one that no, we peaked no. on? The, the European was, of all the football, that, whether it was the league or whether, the, the league was always the most important thing mm -hmm. because that, whether you, uh, where you finish in the league it justifies whether you've given your supporters mm -hmm. what they deserve or you've, uh, sold them short sort of thing. But the European nights were the best nights out of this world uh, to be feeling Ken Princess race and that. Yeah. Uh, she was staying at, she was up the stairs and she was wanting to meet me and we'd lost at home but we would beaten them mm -hmm. five something mm -hmm. away from home and two daughters come and do give me stick because <laughs> I went <laughs> up to the boardroom to meet Princess Grace and <laughs> Prince Rainey or sort of thing. But, uh, the the, uni the the European nights were mm -hmm. uh, something different. The the winter, for instance, although uh, the darkness and the, the floodlights, mm -hmm. uh, there nothing beats playing at night, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And uh, Europe was unbelievable success over the years, and mm -hmm. even other games that uh, we had as well with a lot of success and. Uh, the, the thing, as I said earlier to you, is that the people I always felt important was the supporters. Mm -hmm. And I felt that, uh, can I even you said to my wife umpteen times, I'll need to resign, I'll need to resign, I'll need to resign. We got beaten for maybe two, three games or something mm -hmm. in a row. And she would go that, that yeah. like, just ignore me actually. <laughs> but uh, I was a, a Definitely a bit of pessimistic, although everybody maybe think I was positive, but, but what I, I did, I was very positive in my ideas of fit, mm -hmm. and I definitely attack is better than defence sort of thing. I always uh, played, uh, even away from home, and mm -hmm. told the players you must score away from home, you must score, and we were brilliant away from home. Yeah. We yeah. actually, honestly, had better results away from home than Barcelona, for instance. Yeah. We beat Barcelona even, although we beat them at home as well, but uh, the, the uh, importance of fitness, the, we were second to none. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also, uh, tactically, they were really knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. David Neary was definitely the brains of the defence. and. Heger would go and win the ball and Neri would be covering up anything mm -hmm. if, he, if he maybe missed it a wee bit, uh, Paul Heger doing that. But uh, the players that we were able to get in the time, mm -hmm. and make no mistake yet, I, I've said this just recently and people 
I don't think take it in. It was in the paper. I never made one player. You cannot make a player. All you can do is bring out the best. You can definitely make them fit. And I'll tell you something, there was nobody fitter than us. Mm -hmm. Nobody fitter than us. And, but you cannot make players. You can give them wee ideas on what they can improve on and that. But it's up to what they do and how, how good they are. Mm -hmm. at the thing that, for instance, if, if, if you could honestly make a player, you'd make a fortune. Yeah. But, uh, the, and also, the tactics are vital in the modern game. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I played early on with Hamilton Ackes, and even just before John Prentice came, they handed you a number seven, and that's all, you just knew you had a number seven, you are outside yeah. right. They handed you a number eleven, you were outside left, and that's what they did. They didn't talk tactics and whatever, and uh, when my early days at Hamilton Ackes, for instance, they gave you a number for one to eleven, and whatever the jersey was, was you, you knew where you, where you had to be playing sort of thing. I played outside right actually all the time with Hamilton Mackies because it was only 17 or 16, 17 uh, years of age. But I was never, ever going to be an outstanding winger. Mm -hmm. But because I was the youngest player in the team, that's where they that's usually it, played yeah. them. They didn't play youngins in the defence as quick as they play youngins forwards. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, when I went to Clyde, I changed the inside forward, can we were more involved in the uh, keeping possession of the ball and creating things. And, and also, I was still the forward one rather mm -hmm. than the defensive one because if they were been asking me, I couldn't tackle a fish supper, never mind. Uh, the, the, the thing you mentioned there about the numbers on the bat, that, that was a tactic you used as manager, wasn't it, to send your team out with? Random numbers on the back. I mean, Dave Bowman speaks of you know, wearing like, six or seven different numbers for the team. Aye, but that, the, the game changed with the uh, uh, English. Uh, uh, I won the cup with England actually because that's when they started playing four two four. Uh, when I when I played football with Hamilton Mackies, it was five forwards and five defenders. Yeah. When I played football with Clyde, even it was five forwards and five defenders. And I'll tell you something, I would never be in the five defenders. I would never ever have been in any of the, mm -hmm. the, the five defenders. But I could always uh, create or score goals. And uh, there's no doubts at all that we've taken the game away from supporters nowadays because honestly, everybody that went to fit by that time knew what uh, two was against 11, mm -hmm. three was against seven. And the game was far better for the supporters at that time now. Because as the supporters now, what does number 44 do? Mm -hmm. yeah. The kind of numbers in the game now is horrendous. Mm -hmm. I've seen some 42 or 44 number with somebody, what they do. And the, the point I'm trying to make is people that, that matter are paying their money mm -hmm. and they don't know what, what the managers are doing yeah. and what the managers are expecting. Whereas without any shadow of doubt in the early uh, time in my career, two versus eleven, three versus seven, mm -hmm. nine versus five, yeah. even wing half and inside forward, the same thing. That you had one v one all over the park. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden they started an extra defender because it's easier to be negative than it is positive in life. Yeah. It is easier to be negative than positive. And all they started was an extra defender. I go daft. I, because I was a forward, I said, why would we start with an extra different mm -hmm. yeah. goal scorer or an extra forward? But it was easier to be negative than it is. In life, it's easier to be negative than to be yeah. positive, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And, and that's all I can say is why the, the game has gone the way it, it has gone. And I really believe that the, the 11 versus 11 with five forwards and five defenders was a better contest for people to be paying money mm -hmm. to watch. Yeah. really do. And uh, the extra defender uh, just, in my opinion, made the games more liable to be nothing, nothing than one nothing sort of thing. Uh, whereas uh, goals are what people want to yeah, see. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned um, Barcelona there. Now, I mean, our record obviously against them, winning both the games fantastic. 
Kevin Gallagher is another who will be coming along to the dinner. Um, he scored the first goal. Well, that's the point. And I'm telling you something, I don't believe it. <laughs> and I'll tell you something, he still argues with me. <laughs> he says he's shot. He's shot for the, for the corner flag. <laughs> That's just what I was going to mean. We'd spoke to Kevin, we'd interviewed him a few years back, and he refused to say whether it was a cross or a shot. He, well, he says he was never. I wanted this definitive answer. He definitely, oh. with all the players in the club and myself, told me he shot for the corner fly. <laughs> it was near enough the corner fly. Right, but I still accept the goal, but I don't accept what he said. <laughs> I said, if ever you try and shoot for that again, I'll shoot you. <laughs> Cross it. But it, it was a vital goal. But mm -hmm. Dundee United actually, honestly, uh, have beat Barcelona four times. Jericho had beat yeah. Dundee United. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, beat Barcelona twice as well, I think. Mm -hmm. um, that's good, I mean, because it, as I say, Kevin has always maintained, you know, that. And, he refused to divulge it with us and we'll, we'll play this part of the, on the night and we'll, we'll ask him for his comments and hopefully get him to admit that it was a cross. Um, I threatened to find him actually for shooting for the <laughs> <laughs> I would have fined him for shooting <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the uh, You know, that, that, that UF Cup run, um, 86 87, I think it, it confirmed your reputation as one of the great coaches in Europe. Um, Again, was that something that were you? Did you become conscious of, you know, how how well renowned yourself and the team were in Europe? Well, honestly, I never thought of myself at all. Actually, other than uh, I was the worst father in the world mm -hmm. because what the wife had to put up with was unbelievable. See, if we got beat, she couldn't speak to me for about two days. Mm -hmm. Maybe she was happy that way, that <laughs> way no, but I, honestly, I was terrible. And uh -huh. Friday night, well, I had to get to bed. Fairly early at night, a Friday night, and uh, I, I've said this over and over again that as a, a father and a husband, I was a disgrace, mm -hmm. really a disgrace because uh, player it was okay, but uh, as a manager, honestly, it was seven days a week, mm -hmm. morning, noon, and night, as uh, Eddie Thompson would say, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I never, our, 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 uh, Gary, the younger son, mm -hmm. honestly could have been a professional football player with coaching and that. But I never even spent any time with a really good striker to go the ball and definitely scored some goals. But mm -hmm. he didn't play an awful lot, but when he played, he, he did really well. And I never saw him playing actually because it was Doris. Uh, they used to take the cars to take the kids on the Sunday morning to wherever the park was and it was one of those, it was my wife's car that was the taxi for the, the players and he actually, we, for instance, he scored goals in Barcelona part, apparently kicked the night before the game and sort of thing and mm -hmm. he really enjoyed it. But the older son, he's, he hardly ever went to the games. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, Gary honestly could have been uh, a professional player in my opinion mm -hmm. if I had uh, spent more time uh, with him. Mm -hmm. It's probably it's fair to say though that you know that was the nature of the job. Being a manager really is a, a 24 hour a day, seven day, days a week. Definitely, but it's still unfair. Mm -hmm. It's definitely unfair. You, you've definitely got to balance it. I think when you've been, uh, when you've had a bit of success, you realise it's time to balance it a wee bit better, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Ali Ferguson on the phone to me one time, honestly, this is exactly what he said. He says, what about that, that TV boy? He says, I says, what's, what's wrong? He says, he was in it me the day, I can't remember the boy's name, can he? He says, is he? Is, is, He's interviewing me in the, uh, the day, he says, and he says to us, he says, uh, how do you manage to bring up your family? Fergus says, we don't bring up the family, the wife does. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Honestly, that is true. Mm -hmm. do, Doris brought it, both yeah. the kids up, and uh, it, it's not a, a Sunday, it's a Sunday actually, you're either smiling or you're greeting. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but you're saying this year I'll not be playing <laughs> next week, that year I'll not be playing. You finish up with about two players that you go pick. And then you finish up the Friday that there are actually nine of the team playing <laughs> still playing. <laughs>
when I was going to Hamden, when I was going to meet Rangers, Ken Chilstein was was uh, wanting to meet me, phones me up, and uh, before I'm going over on a Sunday, it was, and uh, he says, who won the league? Kenny asked us, he, he said, take the job, I says, no, he says, I, I think I'm going to stay, I says, but listen to what I'm going mm -hmm. to go for. He says, uh, who won the league this year? I says, we won the league. He says, will you win it next year? I says, oh, I doubt if we'll win it next year. I says, but I honestly believe if we're a good chance of winning a cup or that, can He says, you're a failure. This is word for word, actually. Mm -hmm. And we're standing in Hamden car park and with two cars in Hamden car park. He stayed quite near there, actually. And I'm going to Ibro. And uh, he says, uh, you're a failure. I says, what do you mean I'm a failure? He says, your supporters are now expecting you to win it again, mm -hmm. now that you've won it. And was, what he was doing was try to pressure me into yeah. uh, Ken going back to the West of Scotland. But the only reason I didn't go, honestly, the main reason I didn't go was definitely the upbringing of the kids. Mm -hmm. I definitely wanted the kids to be brought up. My uh, uh, youngest son, Gary, he went to school. Uh, Colin had already been at school and uh, when he went the first day of school, can he come home to his mum he says, Mum, he says, I want to be a Catholic. And uh, Doris says, why do you want to be a Catholic? He says, this big boy had looked after him, Colin, uh, Gary was quite small, mm -hmm. sort of thing, yeah? and the big boy had uh, looked after him on his first day at school and uh, he says, uh, so and so is a Catholic, I want to be a Catholic. And his mum says, Do you know what Catholic Protestant is? He says, No, he says, but so and so is a Catholic. Yeah. And honestly, down in, in Lark Hall, you know uh -huh. within a week or something whether they're Catholic or Protestant. Actually, they walk up to you and say, so, What school do you go to? And whatever, uh -huh. if they're a Catholic, they go that way and you're a Protestant. And if you know you, you're together. Lark Hall is horrendous. Uh -huh. That that offer of that Rangers job, um, making eighty three. Do you do you ever look back and you know? First of all, how close were you to actually going to Rangers? And well, I was desperate to go for myself. Mm -hmm. I did not want to bring up my family yeah. in the West of Scotland. Mm -hmm. Definitely didn't want to bring up them in the Rangers Celtic thing. Yeah. My mother disowned me actually. Honestly, yeah. disowned me. For, well, behind my back, she says. <laughs> Because she was desperate to get us back to around Lark Hall or Ash Hill or something like that. But uh, honestly, the Catholic Protestant thing in Dundee is nothing. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Protestant in Lark Hall is everything. Mm -hmm. Horrendous. Stupid. Yeah. Some of my best pals up here are Catholics, actually. Mm -hmm. Get on with them and that, but. Mm -hmm. uh, Different nature. Also, I mean, there was a, an offer from like, Newcastle in 1984, they, they asked you to go. Now, we spoke there, of, you know, Alex Ferguson, he, 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 he took a job down at Man United, you know, massive club. And he's still there now to, the, to this day. The Newcastle offer, was that something that you, you, you seriously considered going down to England? To that was one of the ones I really considered, actually, because I knew the potential there was, was definitely good and it wasn't too far away, sort of thing. But... Uh, I, I felt that I had signed players on the eight year, four year mm -hmm. contracts with four years uh, option and three year contract with three year option and it would have been absolutely diabolical on my part if I had mm -hmm. walked out and left them tied up to Dundee United for yeah. the lengthy time that they were uh, tied up. and if because it suits me, I'd walk to. That was not the most important thing, but that was the second mm -hmm. most important thing. The most important thing was I definitely wanted to bring up my family in Dundee away for the West of Scotland Catholic Protestant mm -hmm. thing. And uh, people up here honestly don't realise how ridiculous it is. Mm -hmm. For instance, that, there was a boy. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I've told you this before, but I was, I was walking a certain distance trying to find where the, the station was to get back home. I'd went through in the train, can? 
and I'm walking and the, 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 I sees this boy coming and I says, am I walking the right direction for the, the station? And I says, you're definitely walking the right direction, just keep going that way. And he definitely recognised me. He sent me towards Highbrox. <laughs> And then all of a sudden I realised I was going towards the eyebrows. I said, there's no way to yeah. run to get back to the game. <laughs> and I'm certain he honestly recognised me who I was. Mm -hmm. do, do you look, looking back at your professional career, is, is there any regret at staying at Dundee United? I'm definitely always uh, regret not having uh, financially mm -hmm. uh, had far, far more. Uh, money than uh, I do have, but I honestly am very proud of the fact that I tied up on team players so I couldn't go myself, but that was not uh, just the reason. I really believe that Dundee United, uh, I wanted loyalty for the players, but am I a different position to just uh -huh. uh, loyalty go uh -huh. home? Whenever it suits you, and my mother and father were really strong Christian people, and we were definitely brought up very, very strict, and uh, you had to treat everybody the way you wanted to be treated yourself, and whether it was a Catholic or whether it was a Protestant, yeah. and it was actually my mother that brought us up because my father worked as a baker during the night, and he drove taxis during the day to make ends meet, sort of thing, or have extra sort of thing and uh, the, I'm really proud of the way my mother and father mm -hmm. brought us up and I'm definitely uh, proud of my own two sons up here but they've definitely not had the same hassle that, mm -hmm. that we had. Mm -hmm. The orange walk and, and was one of the big things in Black Hole Ash Girl sort of thing and I think it was July or 9th, 9th of July or something like that. They actually used to come and walk for Ash Gill, two mile into Lark Hall, mm -hmm. the orange, yeah. whatever they call it. Uh, but uh, the, I'm really, really proud of my time at Dundee United, mm -hmm. and I'm really, really proud of the people that I work for. Mm -hmm. And Johnson Grant was, without doubt, sitting in this couch here, he was in tears. Mm -hmm. The night before, we, uh, it was sweeties for me, and I think it was uh, wine or something. I bought the wine for Dora. Mm -hmm. The, I mean, you mentioned you mentioned your father there. I mean, how how big an influence was he on well, putting you and your brothers into football? Well, he was he was honestly, it, we there was no park in Ashgill. There wasn't a football park in Ashgill, and they, he he went over with a big shock thing, and it was a big thing where the. You cut the long grass and I think it was corn, corn and that yeah, they would be yeah. normally doing and a lawnmower then to, to trim up and it was only maybe the, the, the size of, no, I'm not much bigger than the garden there, uh, the, we were, the Douglas Drive, there was about, there was a boy Willie Hinshaw would sign with Morton, there was a boy White signed with somebody as well, there was Willie, myself and Tom all went senior and this was just one wee street. Mm -hmm. It was five years, and we didn't even get brought up, we didn't, even, honestly. And then when Tom became, uh, Tom was nine years, ten months younger than me, and I was two years, four months young, younger than Willie. And when T Tom uh, was born, and he was maybe about seven or eight or something, when he was mm -hmm. playing football, why if Tom was a brilliant crosser of the ball, it's because there was only two kids and there was a brand new part in mm -hmm. yeah. And he used to go over and chip the ball. The, boat, the, the wee boy was a wee bit simple, but there's something wrong with him. But uh, he used to go over and chip the ball, hit the bar, hit the bar, hit the bar all the time. And if he missed it, the, the wee boy was in the goal and run after it and go to him. And uh, as I say, when, when Willie and I, all the kids, and, and Ash Gill at that time was around our ages, Ken, mm -hmm. and uh, Willie's two years, four months older than me. And, and then Tom comes along, nine years, ten months younger than me, and uh, <laughs> there's only two of them over a, a brand new park <laughs> practicing. 
you mentioned Tommy there, you know, and also the, the fact that you look back at the 1991 Cup final, um, a fairly unique, you know, circumstance where you and your brother are, are leading teams out. Um, obviously losing that day, you know, m maybe take some of the way, but how proud were you? No, I'd lost more the day before, two days before my father died. Mm -hmm. And it was a horrendous time. Yeah. And uh, the, I've got a courier through here. And the day that my father uh, was getting buried, I got up in the morning to read in the courier here that I should be packing up and looking at myself because we'd lost the bother all. Went daft. Yeah. See when I come, no, the, no, the Monday was a Monday that my father was getting buried. Actually, he died on the Thursday, and uh, it, it, it definitely for a few days brought back how idiotic life has been for me. That football was the mm -hmm. most important thing, Ken. Uh, even Ken, I've never drunk in my life, mm -hmm. and uh, most days. Is why it was uh, definitely I wanted to be a football player, mm -hmm. and uh, the, there's been some pains as well in it, as well, and that was the worst one. I've got the couriers mm -hmm. sitting through there, uh, and I've written at the top here. This was printed in the day we buried my dad, and the headline says it's time for Jim McLean to look at himself and go. <laughs> And I'm no kidding you, we'd, we'd something like finished third in the league and we had sold players as well and made a profit yeah. and we'd go to another cup final. I used to get on and say to people, oh, the reason is that uh, uh, I don't like paying big bonuses and it's a big bonus they've got for winning the cup so we would have just try to lose them. They need to believe me. <laughs> <laughs> When when you speak about you know the, the impact that your your father had on influencing your your own career Thomas' career, do you look back with any satisfaction at that final still viewed as as one of the great Scottish yeah. Cup finals? I honestly tell everybody that was my father was was a forward as well, but he mm. gave up football to uh, marry my my mother. She her side of the family was gospel all people and you know, there was nothing. You could even read a paper on Sunday and you know, they're, they're mm -hmm. still up the north. I don't know if they're still as bad or not, but they were really, really strict, the gospel hall people. And to be completely honest, uh, it's a consolation to me again, the Scottish Cup final, but I'm really proud that if, if you can't win something, your brother's the next best mm -hmm. thing. And I'm really proud of the way the game was, other than the bloody goals it was. <laughs> it was, again, definitely. Alan Main has always blamed himself, and to be completely honest, it was more than Alan Main than they play to mm -hmm. what he was capable of. We'd beat them something like about five times that bloody season. Yeah. It was always beaten, but uh, I think we got them in the League Cup as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the death of my father definitely helped the pain mm -hmm. as much as can. Reason, there was a game against Rangers when Sturrock scored an unbelievable goal. He, he, he shoots for uh, the angle that he mm -hmm. shoots for was the outside left position turned on his right foot and he. Hit it into the nearest side of the, the, the corner, can mm -hmm. and the referee, the linesman, puts up his flag for somebody at the outside right position, John Hall, at the other place. side of yeah. the park. I went actually daft after the, uh, after the game. Uh, that the, the knee way that the player was, John Holt was interfering. Mm -hmm. John Holt should never have been in there, by the way, because <laughs> he never scored there. <laughs> good lad, really good lad. <laughs> A good honest player, <laughs> we joked after it many, many months after it, we joked after it, what the f*** was you doing there? <laughs> now, you've, you've probably touched on something there, you know, the, the, your relationship with the, the referees and, and the SFA, 
Um, a turbulent one at times. I had a season ticket for <laughs> Glasgow, actually. Was, was that just the frustration of yeah. wanting to win all the time? Yeah, definitely uh, blinker that to you only see one mm -hmm. one club in that. But definitely Rangers and Celtic got more decisions mm -hmm. than you. And it's human nature. Yeah. Because if, if I was a referee and 50,000 shouting for a penalty kick, there's far more liable for a getter mm -hmm. than what a five busloads are, especially doing Glasgow mm -hmm. sort of thing. And uh, there's, as I said, we scored a magnificent goal against Celtic and we, we honestly should have won that cup and it finished up a draw. Mm -hmm. We could have beaten the replay. And uh, there's no way it should have been chopped off. Yeah. yeah. We go to 1993, um, you know, when you you came to the end of your managerial career um, at Tannis that day, you went out and you done, you know, after 20, 21 years and 7 months as manager, you went out and you done a, a, a lap of honour. The United fans, you know, quite rightly stayed behind to applaud you. I walked in the park. Yeah, dis despite a defeat that day, you know, but how would you sum up your relationship with the United fans? Well, the supporters were, were definitely brilliant for me, but... Uh, the, the players were got some stick for that one. I said, You're just glad to get rid of me. <laughs> I said, I've changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, I think I really said that yeah. after the game that I was angry with. I was really disappointed that. Uh, was it Aberdeen, was it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, four especially three, Aberdeen. Yeah. But they definitely were in raptures. Mm -hmm. You know, but just recently we were looking at some photos of that day um, and you know it's noticeable that even Aberdeen support stayed behind that day, quite a few of them stayed behind to applaud you. Yeah, um, I had to walk around the bar after it, it was murder. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't mind doing it when we won. But... Mm -hmm. but you, just recently you know, you've, you've attended a few of the, the, the club's dinners and um, you know, I think the, the supporters again have showed you know, just how much they felt, you know, that how much they, they, they hold you in high esteem. Is that, have you always been aware, you know, of, of how Dunyan United fans view you? No, not really, but I've always been desperate for the players and the support, mm -hmm. being the girl. Mm -hmm. I really honestly tried always to uh, do all I could to, to uh, always emphasise how important it was to satisfy the, mm -hmm. the supporters, first and foremost. And uh, every result, uh, contrary to what people believe, I had a wee smile when we won. And it was because of the supporters that uh, was adding to the, mm -hmm. the... We had to win for the supporters. Uh, I've always, I've, we, my family had never had a lot of money or whatever, and we've always known uh, you spend what you can, but you don't spend somebody else's money. And and at the end of the day, I, I've always, I can't remember, I've got a wee thing written down in case I'm asked to say a few words of this thing. And uh, the, you, you've got to honestly realise how much money people spend on on football yeah. and how much you should be every single time you pull a jersey on, given a hundred percent. Because I honestly, I'll tell you this story with Duncan Ferguson. And actually the woman worked with the, the, the lady that it was in Diggs with, worked with Dundee United, eh, Dun, Dundee United, and I was chairman. So Friday night, I always, I always trained them really, really hard. But a no go was somebody going away him to Stirling, somebody going away him to Edinburgh, somebody because it, they've been away all week for girlfriends, pals, and whatever. They would be out for a drink at night, and as I said, I was a teetotaler. So the Friday nights, I used to always phone round to check that the, the race so and so was in the, their dig skin, and uh, not. Skiving away home mm -hmm. to drink or whatever, but uh, I says, could I speak to Duncan? She says, oh, he's just away out to the shop, can? 
And honestly, I was an experienced manager at the time. I don't know what the f she thought she was. So I put the phone down, dialed the same number again. I, I, no, I told them to phone me, can mm -hmm. when he comes in, can So the phones me. Ah, I'm just uh, out for uh, uh, drinks or something for getting uh -huh. iron brew and whatever and sweeties. I says, oh, that's fine. I was just checking up. So he puts the phone down again after he'd phoned me back. Yeah? And the woman must have thought that I was daft, actually. Yeah? So I then dialed the number again. I says, uh, could I have another word with Duncan? Yeah? They had more or less said he's back for the show. Yeah. Uh -huh. But she'd phoned them down at Stirling and he'd phoned them at Stirling. And I went daft, actually. And see the Monday morning, I tore mm -hmm. ribbons off her. And to be honest, I was never near enough sacking her because I was a chairman at the time mm -hmm. as well. Can. I says, do you realise why I do this, Ken, to the woman? Mm -hmm. I says, every player has to be treated the same way. I says, and I hope that every player is treating the game as the same way by not going drinking on a Friday night. I says, after you've been away from your girlfriends for the whole week, or after you're away from your pals for the whole week, there are certain about drinking in the fright, especially Don Ferguson. I says, the whole training during the week's waste of time. If you go drinking on a Friday night, it's a waste of time. And she didn't understand it, honestly, but I went mental. Mm -hmm. That was some of the things that you had to put up with. Duncan Ferguson, you know, he, he left for you know, over, over four million pounds. Um, I mean, how important, you know, was, was deals like that to, to Dundee United at the time? That was, uh, the balance in the books was definitely uh, never going to happen with just attendances. Mm -hmm. And uh, we always had to, uh, maybe every third or fourth year, be selling, uh, well, uh, Andy Gray was the, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The, the first big one, and then there was uh, uh, Raymond Stewart mm -hmm. to West Ham and so on. And uh, it was a vital f part of balancing the books with uh, getting a transfer maybe every two or three years. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the more success that we had, uh, then uh, the Bounce shells and pens was not just as bad to mm. balance the books and so on. But uh, it was also fair to the players because, to be completely honest, uh, if you're one of the best players in Scotland, uh, you do want to play with uh, one of the best leagues, uh, mm -hmm. with one of the best teams in the best mm -hmm. leagues, sort of thing as well. And a new challenge, uh, even for myself as the manager. For uh, I think it was 22 years and 10 months or something that uh, I was involved, and that was a wee while actually. <laughs> so it wasn't that. I mean, I can ask you there, right? You, you, you've been a player, you've been a coach, you've been a manager, you've been a managing director, you've been a chairman. Which one is the one that Jim McLean was most happy? Playing. Playing? Oh, definitely. Playing is the easiest. Mm -hmm. There's so much hassle in any of the other things and there's no doubts that uh, uh, I've been very, very fortunate uh, through the whole of my life of people that I've met and so on as well have been big important mm -hmm. factors. Can Bobby see I see him in the, the ferry now and again and uh, it, it goes back to the Dundee time when mm -hmm. He was a coach and I was a player sort of thing. I mean, he actually gave us a lot of the training session things. That, uh, the, base, the basic thing that I started with was Bobby C's training functions and so on. And uh, the fortunate to have played with uh, clubs that had some fantastic people. John Prentice was without doubt 
uh, he always knew that I struggled for confidence actually as a player and uh, he used to come to me before the game he says now he says if you're not the best man in the part of the day I'll be wondering why and telling you why mm -hmm. that you haven't done it sort of thing and it was you and, and the best the only year that the couple of years that I played anything like uh, what I should have played more often. Uh, and spasms I played, Ken, because Hamill Mackey sold me. Well, I, I was never released, actually, as a player. I got uh, transferred for Hamill Mackey to Clyde, I got transferred for Clyde to Dundee, I got transferred for Clyde for Dundee to Kilmarnock, and I got released for Kilmarnock only as a coach to come back to Dundee. Uh, but not to, I wasn't allowed to play, so I tell everybody, I've never, I'm still retained by Kilmarnock. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, they definitely, people maybe think that I'm a very confident person, and I'm a positive person, but I'm not a confident person. I, I definitely, I ask the wife how often I used to come in and say, I'll resign, I'll need to resign, I'll need to resign. Mm -hmm. And uh, never once was under pressure with Johnson Grant. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, who's without doubt the best chairman ever for me personally. Mm -hmm. That uh, he just treated us like a father, so yeah. of, thing. Of, of all the players, it's probably an unfair question, but all the players you brought through and developed, is there any that gave you the most pride, or is there, was there any that? Overachieved, in your opinion, or you know, was there, was there someone that you thought I've done well with them? Or? John Clark's the best one, and I, I laid into John Clark. He was a hell of a drinker. Mm -hmm. He definitely liked a pint or a few pints, again. So I go to him this night and or this day, and I says to him, "Look, I says I'll no find you. I'll definitely no find you." I says, "But I want to improve the team." I says, "And I want to, more importantly, improve yourself." I says. How much do you go and drink during the week in a night out? He says, well, you know, find me. I said, no, I'm not find you, I'm telling you. I said, I'm wanting to improve you, but also the improvement to the team. I says, which is more important? He says, I drink maybe about 14 pints. I said, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm a teetotal, honestly. I says, you think. He says, no, he says, I drink about 14 pints, 12 or 14 pints. I says, how's about cutting it down to six or seven? Honestly, I couldn't believe it. Uh -huh. And I still don't know whether he was kidding me or uh -huh. not, but he was a hell of a drinker. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, he was as quick as anything. He was a good mm -hmm. goal scorer. I, he actually had, had to be moved back to centre half because he wasn't fat enough to mm -hmm. run about at any other position. Mm -hmm. And he actually finished up uh, being a centre half for a while. Uh, right back, he played an awful lot as well. But uh, honestly, that's a true story. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> 14 pigs. <laughs> He's talking to a teetotaler. <laughs> <laughs> on, on, a, on a similar vein, was there any players you know that you maybe brought through as a youngster and was convinced you know they were going to make it? And you know, for whatever reason. You know, just something stopped them achieving what you felt. Nah, usually the mace, the the ones that were liable to see, it's not only the ability; they've mm. got to be, have a, a a winner attitude as well. The the the, the thinking you you've got to be confident in your own ability as well. Mm. But, uh, when I look at my football career, I know exactly what the weaknesses. Where because we we definitely John John Prentice told everybody the story that Jim McLean was my best player at Clyde. He says and he sat with his jacket and everything on before he would even look at the jersey to put the jersey on until I had announced the team. Mm -hmm. He says and he was my first if he was my first name in the when we were with, yeah. when we were with Clyde sort of thing. The most enjoyable. Uh, thing is definitely playing mm -hmm. because you you definitely are responsible for uh, whatever's happened to mm -hmm. you or no one. Uh, 
I was able to move uh, three times from uh, clubs that were happy with the performances mm -hmm. I was yeah. turning in for them. Mm -hmm. Dundee weren't it? <laughs> when I go <got> there. <laughs> the Dundee fans eh? <laughs> I, th I think I think if you when you look back now, um, I think John, you said it earlier. You know, if, if you made the Dundee fans unhappy when you were there as a player, you certainly made them a lot more unhappy as Dundee United manager. Well, I'm, uh, they loved they loved being Dundee. Oh Jesus! Well, I, I tell you honestly, if you ask a Dundee player about how good Jim McLean was, I'm not joking. I was there three years, and there was a, there was definitely one year I was a top mm -hmm. goal scorer in the team, and I was always. Uh, up near the one, two, three sort of thing because we played mainly five forwards. I was, Stevie Murray played, we played four, two, four, but Stevie Murray was a wing half and I was an inside forward and we were the midfield players. And I was still the top goal scorer from my midfield position with Dundee and I get penalty from. <laughs> Whenever they announced my name, they <laughs> what one of the, what are the, what did the manager says to me? He says, see when I announce your name, <laughs> half the supporter start booing. <laughs> <laughs> can't remember what Bobby Hanson was telling me. Okay, I, I, I don't think there's any doubt. I think, I think you won that battle in the end. I think, oh. <laughs> I think, I think you proved a better man that battle. Your, your relationship with players, um, it was described to me as unique <laughs> the other week. Um, your style of management was oh, that? It was, it was never a good relationship, and and there was a respect mm -hmm. relationship. But a respect is more important than being pals. Mm -hmm. I can assure you, if you're a pal, you're not doing your job all the time. Uh, you've got to hit them when they deserve hit. You've got to. I actually it was wrong, and I didn't uh, praise them enough. I was always. Slaughtering the, mm. the ones that they didn't perform the the way they should have, sort of thing. But honestly, uh, you look back and you you realise how lucky you were. Mm. Can even sign on somebody you don't know they're going to be brilliant. Yeah. But uh, we definitely. Uh, were very fortunate with the people I had around us. And two, we had two of the best fitness coaches, Stuart Hogg and Graham Lowe. Graham Lowe lived here and Stuart Hogg lived in Fife. Mm -hmm. He was a Dunfermline supporter, nicely. And uh, they took us to a level of fitness that I could never have taken them mm -hmm. to because I didn't know when to, or how much to give them yeah, and how. Yeah. Uh, much know to give them, mm -hmm. but uh, the fit beside it was definitely, I was the leader in that, again, and mm -hmm. Doug Cowie and Davy Small were absolutely brilliant. We used to go up to play snooker on a Thursday <laughs> to collect our notes for each other <laughs> because we'd be at different games during the week. Mm -hmm. I offered Doug Cowie a job. Doug Cowie was a coach with Dundee when uh, Dundee United when I got the job. But they'd sacked him during the week to clean, and I never said mm -hmm. they, they sacked him. But I had asked Doug to, uh, if he would come back, I would be really pleased to have him because he was a fantastic player. And later on, I found out what I really good lad he was as well and he's, he wouldn't have come back at all and uh, I then offered him the, coat, the scouting joke in and he, he took that and did a fantastic job. Every single Sunday they were out, him and Davy Small, he played with some English team for a wee while. Both of them lived locally. Yeah. Is there, if, if there's one thing you could change from your managerial career, what would it have been? I win it at Hamden. <laughs> <laughs> we actually won that, uh, we beat Queen's Park there once. <laughs> it's, uh, I suppose it, it, it leads on to another, you know, if, if there's one thing that, that Doris could have changed about your managerial career, what do you think that would have been? 
סוים.
And it is absolutely ridiculous now for uh, the freedom of contract that mm -hmm. uh, clubs have to. You, you actually, you actually, honestly have players for something like about seven years. We were signing kids. Yeah. I was signing kids illegal. Thirteen years when you were supposed to sign them. I was signing uh, players at eleven years of age and you know, keeping the, the club and the, mm -hmm. keeping the, the form and the football because I wanted to start working with them then. Yeah. Yeah. And there was no good starting working with them at thirteen because Listen, because you had missed two mm -hmm. years, sort of thing. And at the end of the day, uh, it was illegal. I'm, I'm not ashamed of it at all because mm -hmm. the supporters were put putting money for me to get the best players out in the park. Mm -hmm. And my job was to get the best players out in the park. Not meaning to be ruthless, but the people I was unbelievably loyal to and the most important people was the supporters. And if I'm wanting them to be paying the money, then I've got to get the best I can out in the park mm -hmm. for be paying to watch something that's worth watching. I think, I think ultimately entertainment is the important yeah. aspect in it. I don't think there's any doubt that... Well, that's what people are paying money to be entertained, actually. That's what I used to say. I said, if Frank Sinatra came and didn't sing a, a bloody song, I said, would you expect to get your money back? Mm -hmm. And I was talking about football. They go in the park half the time and they don't even kick a ball. Yeah. They've been out drinking the night before or whatever. You know, when you look at... First of all, the achievement of getting to a European final. And I think, as you know, it's, it's arguably people will say that that was the best team you created. Um, do you feel that 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 was the pinnacle at that point, or? Uh, I would say yes. The the team that was definitely the best team was McAlpine, Golf Heger in the area, Mal Pass, mm -hmm. uh, Ralph Milne, Billy Kirkwood, John Hole, Middle Park. Derek Stark played middle of the park now and again, and Naaman Bannon, no. and Dodds and Sturrock were, that was the best uh, team, without any shadow of doubt. Andy Gray would be in if you're picking the best yeah. team, and different players would be in, but uh, that's the team that won the league, and that's the team that was the best team and over a period yeah. of time. But, uh, no, the, se the season, 86-87, um, reaching the Scottish Cup final, reaching the UEFA Cup final, um, you know, the, I think the, the scenes at the end of the UEFA Cup final at Tannadice, the, the Gothenburg players being applauded by the United Sport, you know, and the club then getting the, the fair play um, award from UEFA. Fantastic it was. It was fantastic. And also, I was desperate to get the supporters named in the, the stand thing, sort of thing. The, I think the stand up yeah. towards the... Uh, Jerry Kerr stand and up the top or something, the, the new stand up the top I think was named the Fair Play Stand. The Fair Play Stand for the achievement of not only the players but the supporters as well. They were uh, mentioned about their behaviour away from mm -hmm. home and that. But uh, it wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. But that, I mean, that, that, that UEFA Cup run that year, you know, by that stage, when you look at you know, the achievements of winning the League Cup a couple of times, winning the, the league, getting to the European Cup semi final, you know, and then we'll get to 86, 87, you've rebuilt another team, and, you know, they, they, they managed to, to get to a European final. Uh, the one that's best in my mind is honestly the first League Cup win. And it was honestly because of uh, Ernie Robertson. Ernie Robertson had honestly put his cash for his business into the Dundee United uh, club. And not only before then, but uh, that year as well had helped. And uh, honestly, he was standing with tears in his eyes, and I will never, ever forget this. Mm -hmm. He says, Jimmy, says, I never thought I'd love to see this happen in my lifetime and that means more to me than any money that ever mm -hmm. I got yeah. done to United to see that somebody who had been uh, putting money into the club all the time during his, his time, yeah. well, most of the time, but uh, 
that was the first time they'd won a trophy. Mm -hmm. And they were one of the next year as well. But uh, never at hand. <laughs> <laughs> Well, all I could say is thank you for taking the time to Okay, to I hope everything.
Yes, just go back to the